Welcome to Simply by Grace, a podcast of Grace Life Ministries with founder and director, Dr. Charlie Bing. This podcast and other helpful resources can be found at our website, gracelife.org. Now, here's Dr. Bing. So in the book of Jonah, I want to talk about the one that didn't get away. You know, the biggest fish of my life are the ones I've never caught. Isn't that true? The one that you catch, it breaks your line. You hook it, it breaks your line, but you never see it. That's always the biggest fish. That's the one you remember, because you wonder how big it was. So you can make up any fish story you want to that your imagination and conscience allows, because you never really know how big that fish was. Well, we have a fish story today, but it's kind of a fish story in reverse. It's not a man who catches a fish, but a fish who catches a man. So we're going to talk about the one that didn't get away, and that is our friend, the prophet Jonah. You're very familiar with the story. It's taught in Sunday school classes everywhere, but I don't think that the main point of the story is usually made in these Sunday school classes or when the book of Jonah is preached or taught. One Sunday school teacher asked her children, well, what was the story of Jonah about? What's the, what's the lesson that you learned from the story? And little Joey spoke up and said, people make fish sick. Because you know, this fish vomits up Jonah. People make fish sick. Well, there's a bigger message in the book than that, and I hope that we can see that today. And the bigger message has to do with what God wants to do with the world and who he wants to use to reach the world. He wanted to use this fellow named Jonah, who was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. You know at this time that Israel had been separated into north and south, and Jonah was ministering as a prophet in the north. He was a contemporary of Hosea, I think Amos also. And interesting to know that he was under uh, King Jeroboam II. Now, what characterized Jeroboam II in his reign in northern Israel was that it was a very, very prosperous time. They called it the golden age of Israel because their territory was expanding, their wealth had expanded. Very, very rich and wealthy time. We might compare it to the prosperity that we enjoy in America, even though that's being threatened at this time. But nevertheless, it was a very prosperous time where Jonah ministered. But the Assyrian kingdom was in power. And as prosperous as Israel was, they they were subservient to the nation of Assyria, and they had to pay tribute to Assyria. Now, Assyria was not a friendly nation. They, of course, hated the Jews and hated all of their enemies and treated them severely, as I'll illustrate in just a moment. Another thing interesting about Jonah is he's the only prophet that was sent directly to the Gentiles. He was sent to the Gentiles, to the Ninevites in um, Assyria. And he's the only prophet that refused God's word to go. And that's what makes him unique. And that's what brings out the message to us here. It's a, it's a message to Israel. The book of Jonah was written to Israel, but there are things that we can learn today from it. And I want you to notice that even though it's called Jonah and Jonah's uh, throughout the book, the main character in the book is not actually Jonah. It's God. It's God who directs things. It's God who sets things up. It's, you'll see as we go through the story, it's God who's doing the acting. Jonah's just a mere player in this scenario. You see, God wants his people to reach the world. And that's why he sent Jonah to Nineveh. Nineveh was to the east, uh, about 600 miles, which is the distance maybe from here to Denver or Nashville, if you want to get a little perspective from that. The city of Nineveh would be a two month journey by foot. It was probably named, people believe, after the fish god, Nuna. And so Nineveh, you could say, was fish city. Fish town is where, is where Jonah was going. But they were a hated enemy. 
Now let's look at the passage here. Let's just read a couple of verses, a few verses. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. So right away, the Lord is the main character. He's directing things. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. And it was a big city, the largest city next to Babylon in those days. Today, the area would be called Iraq. And cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, wait a minute. Tarshish is not east towards Nineveh. Tarshish is Spain, so it's west across the Mediterranean Sea. It involved a sea trip. He went down to Joppa, which is on the sea coast, found a ship going to Tarshish, and so he paid the fare and went down into it, into the boat, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Twice the presence of the Lord is mentioned here. It doesn't just mean that he went away from the Lord, but the presence of the Lord probably indicates that he was ministering to the Lord uh, as in a formal way, not only as a prophet, uh, but he had a regular ministry with the Lord as his representative. So God says, go east, and Jonah goes west. He disobeys blatantly. Why would he do that? Some people think he might have been fearful for his own life because of the reputation that the Ninevites had. Well, what do we know about the Assyrians and how they treated people? I'm going to read you some inscriptions taken from ancient times. And I've seen actually pic pictographs or uh, engravings and, and um, um, whatever we call them on stone, lithographs, carved in stone in the British Museum in London of the Assyrians doing these kind of things, beheading people, piles of heads, fish hooks through their jaws. Uh, th those are all stolen by the British government and brought to, <laughs> brought to uh, England, and they're in the uh, British Museum. But here's a, a, a quote from an unknown ruler in Assyria. He said, I slew one of every two. I built a wall before the great gates of the city, and I flayed the chief men of the rebels, skinned them, and covered the wall with their skins. Some of them were enclosed alive within the bricks of the wall, and some of them were crucified with stakes along the wall. I caused a great multitude of them to be flayed in my presence. I covered the walls with their skins. Sounds like fun. Ashurbanipal, one of the elite kings of Assyria wrote, he boasted, the heads of their warriors I cut off, I formed them into a pillar over against the city, their young men and their maidens I burned with fire. Shalmaneser, another king, wrote, a pyramid of heads I reared in front of his city. Sennacherib, another king, wrote, I cut their throats like lambs, I cut off their precious lives as one cuts a string, like the many gullets of a storm, I made the contents of their gullets and entrails run down upon the wide earth, their hands I cut off. And then another king later, also named Ashurbanipal, wrote, he described how he treated a captured leader. He said, I pierced his chin with my keen hand dagger. Through his jaw I passed a rope, put a dog chain on him, and made him occupy a kennel. Well, Jonah, I want you to go to these people. That's like sending a CIA agent into Iran or Iraq today. He had reason to be fearful. He had reason to doubt and hesitate, as you can imagine. But was it really for his own safety? Or was it because he knew that God was a gracious and merciful God and might forgive these people and might include him in his blessings? And he didn't want these cruel people, enemies of Israel, to be in God's blessings. I think perhaps the latter, because I think Jonah knew that God was a merciful God. So he heads west, 2,000 miles. Would, it would be a 2,000 mile journey to Spain as he heads there. And Jonah now is in the belly of the ship. And it says in verse four, but the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. And then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God because these were pagans, of course, and they had thousands of God. The Assyrians had 
thousands of God, gods. Many religions today, like the Hindus, you ask them how many gods they have. Some say three million, some say six million, some say 30 million. Everybody has his own special little god. And they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast our lots that we may know for, though, for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And so he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, Yahweh is the word, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah proclaimed that he knew the true God, Yahweh, the creator of the earth, which immediately would make the other gods inferior and they realized this because they asked Jonah to pray to his God. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and they said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more temp tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, it's interesting that they had a conscience. These men, they rode hard to return to land, but they could not for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous around them. And therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with this innocent blood for you, O Lord. They're praying to Yahweh, these pagans are. In the original language, they're praying not to their gods, but to Jonah's God, Yahweh, Lord, you have done it as, you, as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared Yahweh exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and took vows. Well, you see how God is directing things. He, things, he directs Jonah, he directs the storm, he calms the storm. And so far, Jonah has no redeeming qualities except the fact that he offered himself to be a sacrifice and be thrown into the sea. But here he was, as callous as he was, sleeping in the bottom of the ship. There's kind of a descent here as Jonah progresses away from God. He decides to go west instead of east. He goes down to Joppa. He goes down into the boat. He falls asleep. He's as far away from God as he could be. And the funny, ironic thing about the story is everyone obeys God except for Jonah. The sailors are revering Yahweh God. The sea obeys God. And even a fish, a big fish, obeys God. Verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I know we like to talk about the whale, but the word in the Hebrew language just means a fish, a large fish. Could have been a whale because I doubt that in those days they understood the difference between a cold-blooded fish and a mammal whale. Uh, but that's incidental to the story. The fact is it could have been a special fish or it could have been a fish that was known to people uh, at that time. We don't know it, but it isn't explained to us. So God raised up Israel and the prophet Jonah and intended to use them to bless a pagan, cruel enemy of Israel, the Assyrians in Nineveh, the capital city of the area. At that time, Israel was prospering, but they had neglected their worship and service of the Lord. In fact, their attitude was more that they were special, they were God's chosen people, and God was there to serve them. And the Gentile nations were there to serve them. But they had it all wrong in their thinking. 
interesting passage in Isaiah 43, verses 10 and 11. I'll just read some of it. God says you to Israel, you are my witnesses, says the Lord. I, even I am the Lord, and besides there, me, there is no savior. You see, God wanted Israel to be a witness. You are my witnesses. Remember, he called them a holy nation, a nation of priests. Priests represent people to God and God to people, but the nation of Israel was not doing that at the time. In their prosperity, they had turned their eyes inward to their own selfish interests, as we're so tempted to do even here and now, today. We're tempted to forget about the problems of the world and the, peop the needs of the world and, and focus on our 401ks and our, our, uh, our home, the size of our home and, and our jobs and so forth. But God says, you are my witnesses. And besides me, there is no savior. If you are my witnesses, how are people going to get saved unless they hear about me? So Isaiah reminds Israel of their role in God's plan. And so Israel was conveniently or divinely positioned to be a blessing to the world. They were at the crossroads of civilization. That little narrow strip of land there on the Mediterranean Sea on the west coast of Palestine uh, or Canaan was a, a place where people traveled back and forth from north to south. They were at a very influential place in history. God had privileged them not only with position, but with the law and revelation and, uh, and prophets and leaders. They had so many privileges, but instead of using those privileges to serve God, those privileges made them proud and self-centered. They were immoral. They were materialistic. They were callous to God's purpose, just like Jonah was callous to God's purpose when he went to sleep in the bottom of that ship. And so Israel was sleeping to God's purpose at that very time. And I really think that that is what the story intends to show, that Jonah represents the state of Israel at that time. Running from God's purpose, lazy, selfish, complacent, callous, refusing to be God's channel of blessing to the world. And so Jonah would have, in the story, will experience something like death, or maybe some people believe actual death, in the belly of this fish. And, and in a way, Israel would have to die to itself if God was going to use Israel to reach the world. Listen to the words of I, uh, Jonah's contemporary, Hosea, in chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Wow, that sounds pretty prophetic, doesn't it? In this passage, Hosea is saying that God is going to somehow uh, bind us up and then he'll revive us after three days that we may live in his sight. And that's the experience of Jonah. But Hosea was saying that needs to be the experience of Israel as well. So have you ever wondered why God has delayed his coming, why Jesus has not yet come for us and taken and, and judged the world and, and taken us up to be with him? Maybe he's got something for us to do like he had for the nation of Israel to do, like he had for Jonah to do. You ever wonder why the United States is positioned in this world to be the most powerful, richest country in this world with the most influence everywhere? I tell you and you know that I've been around the world many times and everywhere I go people look to the United States almost like a paradise and that's why we have people streaming in from our borders because they look to the United States as an example of prosperity and blessing and we have been blessed greatly by God but why why us there must be a reason that God has held his hand of totally destroying us is there a purpose for the United States, the greatest sending nation in the world when it comes to missions and missionaries and spreading the word of Jesus Christ? Is there a purpose that God has saved this country for or the church in this country or you and me? And the scriptures tell us even that for a temporary time, for a time, God has set aside the nation of Israel 
and blinded them to the gospel. Why? So that he can turn attention to the Gentiles, you and me, who will make and provoke Israel to jealousy because his purpose is he wants to see the Jews, he wants to make the Jews see us worshiping their Messiah so that they'll get jealous and eventually come back to him, which they do as promised all Israel will be saved. I think what we see from the narrative in chapter one is that God wants to use people to reach the world. He doesn't want to use spiritual beings or angels or messages in the sky. He wants to use people, but people must be willing to go in obedience to him. We don't need to go with a lot of knowledge. We just need to go and tell people what we already know. We don't need to have it exactly uh, every I dotted and every T crossed exactly perfectly the same. God can use us and our, our sometimes confusing message that we preach. Of course, he uses a clear message more effectively, but God can use us if we're just willing to go. Dawson Trotman, who founded this ministry called The Navigators, said this. He said, it's not how much you know, it's who you know and how well you know him and how much you want to make him known. You are a player. You see, there's no bench sitters in God's program. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, you will be my witnesses to the uttermost ends of the earth. That's you and me. What's a witness? A witness is simply somebody who can share what they know, tell what they've seen, share what they've heard. That's all a witness does. They don't have to be a preacher. They don't have to be a teacher. Just a witness that says, this is what I've experienced. This is what I know. Jesus, God loves me and Jesus has changed me and given me eternal life. So I think just like God wanted Israel to reach the world, like he wanted Jonah to reach the Gentiles, so God wants the church to reach the world today, of course. And are we, how are we doing with that task? I think like Israel represented Jonah, um, or Jonah was represented, represented Israel, uh, so the church has a role, a similar role in God's program today to be used to reach the world. Jonah was written to God's people. He gave him, he had a, an assumed task that they would use their privilege to accomplish in sharing with the Gentile people that surrounded them. How is the church doing? Well, 1% of all giving in the evangelical church goes to missions. No, I'm sorry, not one tenth, one tenth of a percent. That means if you give $1,000 to the church, the average evangelical church, $1 goes to missions. 2% of, church, of a, most churches' missions budget, this is an average, 2% of a church's missions budget goes for overseas cross-cultural ministries. And even less of that to those who are unreached. So are we accomplishing the task? It's difficult to say with those kind of percentages. And we can't do everything, but we can do something. We may not feel like we have resources. We may not feel like we have a big church, but we can do something. Something can be done. And who knows what God, what great things God can do with little. You know that he's in the business of making much out of little. If God can do it, if God can reach the Gentile people without Israel, he can certainly reach the world without us, Gentiles, today. In fact, Romans warns us that just like the Jews were set aside by God temporarily, he can also do that with us Gentiles if we become presumptuous and proud. He can set us aside. He talks about the, the wild branch being grafted in. God can take it out as well. So our responsibility then is to join God in his program. Someday all Israel will be saved. But until then, we have many, many people to reach. So we have Jonah now swallowed by a great fish. He wants to use God's people to reach the world. But one thing that is helpful 
in motivating God's people to do that is that we must never forget what it's like to live without God's grace. And I think God wants to teach Jonah a lesson in chapter 2 in the belly of this whale but reminding, by reminding him what it's like to be without God's grace for a while. And so this great fish swallows him and he's there three days and three nights. Now hold on, many people say, that's just a story, it's fantasy, it couldn't be true. But actually there's 38 species that are capable of fish and whales that are capable of swallowing a person whole. For example, and I'm not saying this was a sperm whale, but the sperm whale is one of the whales that does not eat plankton, but it eats giant squid and octopus. They grow to be 60 feet long, their mouth is 20 feet long, the hole in their, their, their throat is uh, 15 feet by 8 feet. Plenty of room to swallow a man. In fact, there are stories that I read this week, and I won't take time to read, about people who were swallowed, and they came out of a sperm whale a couple days later, a couple days later, bleached white from the digestive juices, and talking about how hot it was in there, and they were out of their minds too, as you probably would be if you were in a whale's belly for a couple days. So it is possible on the human level, but we don't even need to think of it as a human level. If God wants it done, it's done. I don't have a problem with it. So a little boy gave a report in front of the school and, and Joey told the story of Jonah and the whale. And the teacher said, well, you, you uh, really don't think a whale could swallow a man and a man could live, do you? How could that be? And the boy said, well, I don't know, but when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. And she said, well, what if he's not in heaven? And he said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> but you see, Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 endorsed the story of Jonah. He spoke of it as a reality. He said, just as Jonah was swallowed by the fish, and was there for three days, so shall the Son of Man be. And he talked about the sign of Jonah, which was something that is raised from the dead. Of course, that doesn't mean that Jonah died. Maybe he did. Some people think he did. But the point is that he was as good as dead, and yet he was saved from that. And so there's also symbolism that you might note from the fish swallowing Jonah, because if Nineveh was, Nineveh was indeed named after the fish god, Nuna, and they worshiped the fish god, well, there's some symbolism there with the fish swallowing him. But let's look at what happened uh, in the belly of this whale in chapter 2. From there, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, now this indicates to me that he's not dead if he's praying, he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. And out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Now, Sheol was just, in, 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 as understood in the Old Testament context, was just the place of the dead. It didn't mean heaven or hell. It just meant a place where dead people went. And so Jonah's recognizing that he was as good as dead in the belly of this whale. It doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessitate that he actually died. So out of the belly of Sheol, I cried and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me in your billows and your waves passed over me. So he went to a place of death, but he could still pray. And God heard his prayer. And I think when Jesus refers to Jonah being swallowed by the fish and talking about the sign of Jonah because Jesus himself would actually die and be raised from the dead, it didn't necessitate that Jonah actually die because it was, it was illustrating what happened to Jonah is going to be similar to the experience that I'm going to have in dying and rising again three days later. Then in verse 4, Jonah says, uh, I, Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. You see, he had the assurance that God was going to do something for him. He said, I will look 
again towards God's holy temple, the dwelling place of God. He understood that as far away from God as he had run and as far away from God as he could be in the belly of a whale in the bottom of the sea, God's grace had never forsaken him. God's grace was there. God's love was there. And he was able to cry out and ask God for an expression of that love and grace. <clears throat> and then he goes on. Um, the water surrounded me, even to my soul, his life. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Doesn't sound like a lot of fun in, in the belly of this whale. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you brought me up. You brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. He was as low as low could be. And yet God raised him up from that pit of death. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. And those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. And I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. He says some interesting things here. From his near-death experience or his deadly experience, he recognized God's grace. And he recognized how God's grace was so superior to the worthlessness of the idols of the pagans that were even on that ship. Because he says in verse eight, those who regard these worthless idols have forsaken their own mercy. Or the word in the Hebrew language is chesed or loving kindness or God's uh, merciful and gracious uh, actions towards us, his attitude towards us. One of mercy and grace and, and, and tenacious love. The pagans didn't know this because they were worshiping idols. And those who worship idols live in an atmosphere of fear continually. They fear everything. So they have to sacrifice to the idols. They have to pay money to the idols. They have to give it sacrifices of fruit or animals or, or, or blood, whatever it is, to appease the gods so the gods aren't angry with them. But that's not how our God works. And so those who worship these idols forsake what is available to them through God's mercy and his grace. It could be theirs, but they don't take advantage of it. You see, only Christianity understands, comprehends, and appropriates God's grace. All the other religions of the world, I'm telling you, operate out of fear. And even many Protestants and Catholics have fallen into this very same trap that they serve God out of fear, that God's ready with this, this, to press the cancel button on them or the delete button on them, or hit them with a giant fly swatter. Instead of understanding that God is the God of grace and he's on our side. And he promises that when he then is redeemed that he will sacrifice to God and pay his vows to God. Not because he has to, but because he wants to. So our worship is a response to God's grace. We don't get it to deserve God's grace or to earn God's favor, we give it in response to God's grace. But then in verse 9, it ends with what I think is the lesson that Jonah needed to learn and that maybe we need to learn too. That only Yahweh God can save. Salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of Yahweh. God is a God who has designed salvation in a way that it can be reached by all people everywhere by those who are willing to go and share it and maybe so maybe jonah is coming to a realization when he says this that you know what it's not my prerogative as a prophet to decide who gets saved and who doesn't and if god wants to save these nasty evil wicked people called the assyrians then that's his prerogative salvation is of the lord he will provide for them through the death of his son someday. Maybe Jonah knew that. Maybe he didn't. But the truth of it is God will provide that salvation to all who turn to him for it and accept it from him. 
He's in charge of saving people. We don't get to choose what color or what nation or what language that we go to. It's his prerogative. God has provided for all of, all of the world's people. And it, it's his initiative. God took the initiative in sharing his love by grace through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. And so we today don't have any more right or privilege to choose who's going to be saved than Jonah did. You see, Jonah thought that Israel deserved God's blessings and grace, not Assyria. And so he wasn't going to go. And I think many times our mindset today is that, you know, the United States has been blessed and we are a special country and, and we don't need to go. Let's just keep that blessing here. And so we fail to understand that salvation is of the Lord. And then verse 10 ends the chapter. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. He'd learned his lesson. The fish vomits him up on the dry land. His life is saved. As can be said, you can't keep a good man down. And so Jonah lives to accomplish God's purpose, as we'll see when we get to the second part of the book at another time. But I think what we should see today here is that God is in charge of salvation. God's the initiator. He's the one who effects it, accomplishes it, gives us the message, gives us the power, gives us the command, gives us the commission, gives us the resources to reach the world only if we're willing. We have this message of grace that the pagans don't understand, that unbelievers don't understand, that non-Christians don't understand. We have this message of grace. Jonah had truth, but he did not have grace. It really is discomforting me to me today to see so many people that I know, colleagues in ministry even, who are so preoccupied with the truth of the gospel and defining it exactly and making sure that we even use exact words and so forth, but I don't see them sh sharing that gospel with anyone. They're nitpicky about how I share it and how you share it and how others are sharing it, but I don't hear them talking about winning people to the Lord. They're full of truth, but where's the grace? You see, I think Jonah, his theology was as clear as ice, but it was just as cold. And we can have a theology that's as clear as ice and have everything perfectly theologically lined up, all our ducks in a row, all our T's and I's dotted, crossed. But if we don't share it, where's the grace? Jesus was full of truth and grace. Shouldn't we be also? And wouldn't it be different if we thought for a moment what it was like to be lost and separated from God forever? That's what hell is. It's a place of separation from God forever where we have no experience of him. We, we are in darkness and we are in torment. And what would it be like? Jonah got a little taste of that and it rejuvenated his mission. I have a letter here that was written to a newspaper columnist, and he's a fellow in prison. This is how he describes his experience, which sounds much like I would in pic uh, picture hell. He wrote, prison is where one ceases to live and merely tries to exist as best he can in an unbearably noisy atmosphere. It is a place of frustration and futility, a place of little hope and much hopelessness. Prison is too many days without beauty or the sound of honest laughter. Too much time in emotional and spiritual darkness. A place where true smiles are rare and kindness almost non-existent. It is the vacant, sick feeling that grows within the minds of those who wait for letters that never come and visitors that never appear. 
Prison is a narrow steel cell where one has no privacy, a box, box which magnifies the constant ungodly noise. It is living locked in a steel box, listening to the strains of an old song on the radio, a song that brings back memories of happier days that are lost forever. Prison is a nothingness of days and nights that never change, a place where only those who have existed there can ever know what a living hell is. What if God had left us to our own devices and that would be our experience? But there are people who, who will experience that unless they hear the good news of God's grace. But how are we going to do that? I think like Jonah, like Israel, we have to die to ourselves. Hosea says Israel is going to have to die to us themselves in order to reach the world. Jonah had to symbolically metaphorically die to himself in the belly of a whale before he would be agreeable to go and reach the world. And it's only going to get accomplished if we die to ourselves. That means saying no to some things that we want. How we would spend our time, how we would spend our money, how would we spend our resources, our Sundays or our Wednesdays or our summer vacations. Death must precede new life. God can use us if we're only willing to go. Well, I started with the fish story. Let me close with a somewhat kind of a fish story. You see, Karen and I went to Alaska for five days, and I like to do a little bit of fishing when I'm there. And we like to eat crabs, so they have a lot of crabs up there in Alaska. We even caught our own Dungeness crabs. Boy, that's good. But one of the things I did, I went two years ago with a friend and our sons, and we brought our sons to Ketchikan, and we had a little tour, uh, arranged for a little tour where they take you to a place where you can, all you can eat crabs, not a bad thing. And uh, our driver was a young lady in, in her 30s, you could tell. Her name was Jerry Lynn. And uh, Jerry Lynn was very nice and friendly. We had a nice conversation. She took us to the half hour drive to the, the restaurant on the water. And uh, then after the feast, the crab feast, she took us back to our hotel on the way back we shared the gospel with Jerry Lynn. And of course, like many of the uh, indigenous peoples up there, she had practiced some traditional religion, but was pretty much non-religious. Had a lot of problems in her life, past substance abuse of kinds, and physical abuse, marital problems. And, uh, but she was very friendly and very open to what we were saying. And At the end of our journey, when we came back to the parking lot where we, she had picked us up, I asked her if she understood what we had been talking about. And I asked her, do you want to let me lead in a word of prayer and thank Jesus that he died for your sins and that gives you eternal life? And she said, sure. So I prayed with her there. And I haven't kept in touch with her. I pray for her occasionally. I haven't kept in touch with her, though. And So two years later, Karen and I go back, and I've arranged for the same little tour, and we meet the, another van in the parking lot. It's a BP be picked up, but this time it's a fellow driver. And I asked the fellow driver, I said, oh, last time some young lady named Jerry Lynn picked us up. Uh, which, how's she doing these days? She still work for you? And he said, oh, she died. She died from diabetes. Just being obedient, just sharing the gospel wherever you go, just being available, just being a witness and telling what you know. You don't have to tell it perfectly don't have to tell it boldly. Just tell it. Just be willing to let God direct you. Father, we thank you for the story that you've preserved for us through the years that challenges us out of our comfort zones to go to those who are not like us, perhaps, because you left a perfect place to come to this imperfect world. And help us to share the message that you have given to us. And what a privilege it is that we have to share that with others. Help us to use our remaining days our church ministry, the freedom that this country gives us to share that gospel with the world that you love, as evil and wicked as it is. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for listening. For more resources, or to help spread the message of God's life-changing grace, visit our website at gracelife.org. We'd love to hear from you. Send us a message at simplybygrace.org at gracelife.org.
See you next time.